Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator of the EBM Tools Network and editor of the Marine Ecosystems and Management Newsletter. And we're very pleased to be co-sponsors of today's Panorama Blue Solutions webinar. Uh, and I will let Marie, when she comes on, give you more background on the webinar series and today's webinar. And I, I um, and my partner, Nick Wainer, from Open Channels today are going to be handing, handling the technical aspects of the webinar. So um, as all of you can see there in your user interface for GoToWebinar, there's a question panel. If you have any questions, both technical and substantive questions, um, you communicate them with us by typing them into the question panel and we will see them. Um, Nick and I will handle any technical questions. We'll probably just reply to you as an individual. Um, but if you have any questions for the, the speakers or um, about the topic, Please go ahead and send those in too at any point during the during the webinar, um, and we can handle those questions during the question and answer period. But again, I encourage you to uh, send in any questions you have, both technical and uh, questions about the subject matter, uh, through the question panel of your user interface. Just go ahead and type them in. Okay, over to you, Marie. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome also from my side. My name is Marie Fischborn. I work with IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Today's session is part of the Panorama webinar series, and I'm going to speak more about Panorama in just a moment. So we run regular sessions on various issues that are covered by Panorama. Now today's webinar is hosted by Blue Solutions, which is a global project implemented in partnership by GIZ, GRID, Arendal, IUCN, and UN Environment. Blue Solutions provides capacity development op opportunities and facilitates the exchange of successful experiences in marine and coastal conservation and sustainable development. And we are supported on this session by the EBM Tools Network, Open Channels, Marine Ecosystems and Management, and MPA News, as uh, Sarah and Nick explained. So let me give you a quick overview of the agenda. We'll start with a brief introduction, introduction of the Panorama Partnership itself. And Ali Ferretti will then provide some keynote remarks, followed by two solution case studies from Madagascar and Indonesia. I'll be introducing each of the speakers in more detail later on. And we hope that there will be lots of food for discussion and questions, so please at any point in time type your comments and questions into the question box as just explained, and we'll then address them in that second part of the webinar. And as you do that, please also state your country and affiliation. And then we'll close it in about one hour from now. So we were, we were very happy to see that uh, this topic has generated very widespread interest. Uh, we had about 250 registrants from all the countries that are indicated through pins on this map. And also some people have probably joined spontaneously, so that's fantastic. Even so, of course, for some of the countries, um, it's, not a, it's not a very convenient time, so thank you all for joining. Now let me briefly introduce Panorama. It's a partnership initiative to facilitate learning from success in conservation and sustainable natural resource management. And through Panorama, we collate, document, and share solutions that showcase how nature conservation can benefit society. Panorama is currently a partnership of five organizations. You can see their logos on the slide. And it is led and coordinated by IUCN and GIZ, the German Development Corporation. In the bottom part of the slide, you can see the logos of some of the institutions that have contributed solution case studies, and some actually don't even have a logo. So this is to show that it's a very inclusive effort. A wide variety of government agencies, academic institutions, community groups, and of course, large and small conservation NGOs have contributed to this. Principally, it is open to anyone as long as their solution meets a few simple criteria. Our role as Panorama Partners 
is just to provide a platform for sharing and exchange to act as conveners or knowledge brokers, as we also sometimes call ourselves. How does it work in practice? Well, no need for you to try and delve into all the elements of this infographic. I'm just going to briefly introduce the core idea of the process. It starts with a so-called solution provider who submits a case study uh, documented in a standardized template which we've developed and tested over the last couple of years. And the aim of that template is to identify and describe replicable core components that made an approach successful. We call these the building blocks of the solution. So with these building blocks, with this format, we really look for the common elements that constitute success across geographies. The solution with its building blocks then gets fed into a searchable global database and another practitioner in search of inspiration, let's call that person the solution seeker, can query the database and recombine and adapt building blocks to find a new solution to challenges he or she is facing in, in his context and geog geographic uh, situation. So for the solution providers, it's really about increasing the leverage and impact of their work, but also about gaining visibility on this global platform uh, and this partnership that is backed by credible organizations and to gain recognition for good work. But it's also a process of self-reflection and self-learning. For the solution seeker, the benefit is abo about avoiding to reinvent the wheel by building on successful approaches, for example, in designing new projects. So essentially, Panorama is a mechanism to connect people around success stories, to inspire and empower them, and to scale up these successes. We've come up with some simple criteria for what constitutes such a solution. There's more detail behind each of these, but principally, a solution is something that's, that has had a proven, a measured, or testified impact and is more than just an idea. Elements of the solutions can be applied with slight modifications, of course, in other geographic, social, or sectoral contexts or at a larger geographic scale. And finally, it must be topic relevant, meaning that the overall umbrella for Panorama is um, that these solutions address conservation and development challenges in an integrated manner. The solutions are being shared and exchange is being promoted through a variety of channels and formats. They are all being published on an online platform. We also facilitate face-to-face -face exchanges and trainings, uh, integrating these case, study, case studies into various workshop formats. And finally, the solutions are being promoted through communication activities such as newsletters, publications, on social media, and through webinars such as today's. The Panorama web platform is the repository of all these uh, case studies, and it allows you to explore the solutions in different ways. For example, on a map, you can search and filter in a variety of ways and, of course, view the detailed descriptions of each case study uh, in much more detail. Actually, there's much more detail on the platform than what you'll hear in the presentations today. And you can also submit your own case study for review directly through the platform. Panorama is structured into themes, which on the web platform are reflected through sub portals. These are entry doors for different communities of practitioners into the case study portfolio. We currently have three of these themes, but they are all interlinked and the portals are intersearchable on the platform to facilitate cross-thematic learning. And the underlying learning methodology is really applicable across topics. It's universal. We're now actively expanding to include further topics and new partners, such as the next upcoming theme on sustainable agriculture. So we're, we're very much looking forward to that being launched later this year. Now, before I hand over to our first speaker, I wanted to also briefly allude to 
the issue at hand today, uh, the issue of marine area governance with community engagement, the terminology on this is as diverse as the situations and strictly speaking the title of this webinar is inaccurate because we will not only speak about community-led but also about shared governance and very different forms of community engagement are appropriate and possible in different regional contexts. The two case studies that will be introduced present actually two different models of governance. And some forms of community-led marine area governance don't fit at all with the formal definition of an MPA or marine protected area. And I'm sure Ali Ferretti will elaborate on that point. It's also very important to recognize that protected area management is different from governance. Man management is about what is being done in pursuit of given objectives. Whereas governance is about who decides about what is to be done and how those decisions are taken. So today we're talking about different uh, governance models. IUCN and the Convention on, Biologic on Biological Diversity distinguish four principal types of protected area governance. By government, shared governance, by private individuals and organizations, or by indigenous peoples and local communities. So this webinar will include interventions relating to types B, shared governance, and type D, uh, governance by local communities. So with this, let me hand over to Ali Ferreti Tavake. It's my great pleasure to introduce him. He will set the scene for our session. Ali Ferretti is the Council Chair and Technical Advisor of the Locally Managed Marine Area International Network and he is joining us from Fiji this morning. Good morning Ali Ferretti, over to you. Mbula Binaka and greetings from uh, the Pacific and from, uh, from Fiji uh, in particular. I I think that the the topic I'd like to share with you this morning, um, depending on where you are, is on uh, scaling uh, uh, community-led MPAs. And thank you to Marie for for allowing these opportunities. Yeah, and I'm going to. Um, provide a little bit uh, of a background on why community involvement is important, uh, referencing mainly the Pacific context, and uh, I'm sure the other two colleagues will share uh, the importance uh, for the other, uh, you know, the other regions as well. And uh, a little bit about uh, the, you know, the terminologies, uh, particularly locally managed marine areas, uh, and the marine protected area, uh, probably uh, illuminating the categories that uh, Marie presented on, eh? and uh, and um, I, I'll uh, I'll end with uh, some of the enabling factors uh, and challenges in scaling up uh, uh, LMMAs and MPAs. Uh, uh, perhaps as a, a lesson learned that uh, that. Uh, we are offering uh, as well. The, the Pacific um, or perhaps uh, the, the Oceania region, uh, uh, literally the ocean of, uh, of islands, eh? there are more islands than um, you know scattered around the vast uh, uh, ocean and, uh, and many uh, communities, uh, in fact, around 80%, more than 80% of communities uh, live along the coast. So the attachment to the ocean and the coast is, uh, you know, is, uh, is critical. Uh, they are um, also the lifeblood of their livelihoods. Uh, and another aspect as well uh, is that, uh, you know, in, in some countries and in in Fiji, 80% of the land uh, and the sea uh, are owned by communities, uh, and uh, 
and these are coded as well in the practices uh, and in the what we call the, the land and marine tenure uh, system uh, that comes um, that, uh, that that governed uh, that govern the the resources or the assets that they uh, that they look after and care for. I think the important uh, uh, aspect as well is that um, you know this you know the ocean as we all know is um, is not as healthy as we would would have like uh, likely to be and uh, and uh, for most of these uh, communities uh, that we work with or that we are talking about. Uh, you know the the ocean is uh, you know the health of the ocean also determines their survival, uh, and uh, and that is the case for many of the communities here in the Pacific. So it is essential uh, for them to look for solutions to help um, to improve uh, the health of their marine areas as well as their their and and eventually their livelihoods. I'll, I'll turn. To look at some of the, the motivations uh, behind, um, you know, the community-led uh, uh, MPAs or LMAs, as uh, uh, as you call it, uh, uh, for you know, the, I think we we all acknowledge that coastal fisheries uh, are over exploited, and uh, and uh, you know we, we will not be able to meet our future needs. Uh, if we continue with business as usual, be able to change that uh, uh, the status, uh, we we need to radically change the way we we, we do things or the way that we are currently managing our ocean. Um, and the, secondly, the most vulnerable part of the ocean, the the coastal areas, uh, uh, you know, with development impacts and uh, overfishing and even climate change. Uh, and, and the connectivity of the people, uh, their land, uh, uh, and what they do every day is very, uh, very critical. And if if this system, the marine system, is allowed to collapse, the main the people that are going to be affected the most are the, the community, uh, which, who are already are already you know uh, you know part of the population that are that are living below poverty level um, and uh, so it's even in putting more pressure uh, on them and on the resources uh, uh, as well now um, let me let me change um, uh, uh, course a bit to, to say that the, the the movement or the network uh, of uh, practitioners who uh, have been um, trying to address uh, the issues that I've mentioned are called, um, uh, you know, are using the term uh, locally managed marine area. Uh, you know, the term means that it's a defined marine uh, area that is under some form of uh, community managed uh, or indigenous uh, uh, managed and uh, and governed, or co-management or shared governance. So uh, that is what uh, we what is defined as the the LMMA or locally managed marine area. The I think that's the bottom line uh, in here is that uh, it the the concept of local management. Uh, invokes the mana in the traditional management systems. Uh, it uses that as a basis or as a starting point. Uh, in here, um, you know, in the case of Fiji, and this resonates across the Pacific as well, that when the chief is installed or when the chief dies, there are protocols that, uh, that are in place uh, for communities to uh, observe a certain portion of their reef uh, it was a way of uh, uh, rejuvenating the environment. And it's this concept that we're using as a starting point uh, to either um, you know, organically evolve and improve uh, these traditional management practices to meet the current uh, challenges of, uh, of, uh, of the 
the current challenges there is. What uh, I'll elaborate the next few slides, uh, if you are able to follow, uh, I'm going to uh, elaborate or illustrate a little bit more on what these locally managed marine areas are and what are the tools that are uh, that are um, uh, encompassed uh, or are being practiced. The first one is, uh, which is the most important one, is uh, that the uh, that uh, communities have rights to this land and, uh, and sea. And, and this, in some ways, uh, invokes the, the need for reef to reach uh, management action. Because uh, it's, the, uh, the, it's the same uh, communities that are fishing uh, or the, uh, that are also farming and, uh, and looking at the uh, whole um, you know, the land. Uh, and the sea uh, interface as part of their management is very critical, uh, given that the land uh, impact to uh, has uh, the, the impact that the land has on the marine as well. And the second, uh, I guess, the first uh, one there is excess uh, restriction. Uh, most, um, you know, most. Uh, communities have areas that they have influence over. Uh, some are more uh, uh, are more formal in that they are, these lines are actually uh, demarcated. Uh, but it, what uh, this uh, excess restriction does is helps in uh, in reducing the 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 tragedy tragedy of the the commons. You know, with the free for all. Uh, so it helps uh, provide some regulatory measures for the areas that they have uh, influence over. Uh, and in the way, uh, once they have the excess uh, uh, rights, uh, they are able to uh, uh, do or, or put in place management, uh, uh, management systems that, uh, uh, that are suited or uh, contextualized for that particular area that they manage. <clears throat> uh, it also includes species uh, restriction, uh, uh, taking into account these uh, charismatic species or uh, species that are important globally. Um, and uh, gear restrictions, uh, size limits, uh, these are the uh, management tools that they use or, or, or right sizing. Uh, identifying a species and putting a size limit and, and in most cases uh, this can be internalizing uh, government or national uh, laws or regulations but uh, it can also include uh, uh, locally designed rules uh, you know that uh, have depend on their experience. Uh, periodically harvested uh, closes, um, you know, these are no-take that are, uh, you know, like one year or two years. Uh, Alifarit, and, excuse yes. me, just, sorry. I'm sorry to yes. interrupt you. Yes. We're running a little bit over time already, so if possible, could you wrap up within the next Am one I... or two minutes? Is that okay? okay. Thank you. Correct. And uh, and uh, this, the next tool is uh, is on permanent closes, uh, permanent closure. Uh, this is what we call uh, calling the the no take is of the marine protected areas. Uh, I would uh, uh, say that the process that's uh, taken and is all uh, integrated, um, you know, management at the village level, looking at waste management, disaster. Uh, you know, essentially the point. That uh, uh, that is used uh, here is that uh, MPAs on its own uh, may not work as well as we would have liked. So uh, MPAs in the context of uh, uh, local management that uh, integrates uh, in waste management, disaster preparedness, uh, you know, is have a more chance of uh, of. Um, you know, being successful uh, than uh, MPA on its own. Eh? And uh, in, in many cases, these uh, locally designed rules are then formalized, uh, formalized into 
uh, agreements where you know communities are part of uh, of that, uh, and uh, as well as the uh, through the monitoring uh, we, we, where they are trained in monitoring the success of the the, the rules, whether it's uh, working or not, uh, and, and training and uh, done to the communities themselves to be able to see for themselves. Uh, the changes over time, whether it's a positive or negative, um, and uh, I would I would like to end uh, by saying that these are the tools uh, that uh, has been, you know, experience has have, uh, been able to scale be scaled up uh, at the island uh, level. Um, you know, where you know the you know, from village to village to village, and the lessons and experience have been shared uh, both uh, verbally or through peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, and uh, in, our, in our experience is that uh, this process uh, has helped in, uh, in achieving 100% uh, co-management or shared uh, management and govern, uh, governance. Uh, it can also uh, you know, achieve 100% right uh, management tools uh, for the issue or the challenge that they're trying to address, and um, and the planning process also uh, achieving, uh, more importantly, uh, their livelihood needs. Uh, in, in in a way, uh, the the level of restrictions uh, we've also managed to achieve five to thirty percent uh, of uh, you know closed areas uh, restrictions that are uh, in uh, that are, are termed as uh, marine protected areas uh, so in a way the process achieves both uh, 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 you know, targets MPAs as well as uh, um, whole uh, governance or whole management uh, of the marine area and this is what we are calling uh, the 100% uh, solution, both spatially and also uh, invoking the, 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 the local uh, knowledge uh, married with uh, modern uh, science to uh, manage the marine areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali Feriti, for this introduction and this perspective from the South Pacific. Derek, could you please please uh, make me the presenter? Thank you. We're now going to move to the Western Indian Ocean, and we're going to hear from colleagues uh, from Blue Ventures. We'll have George Big Manahira, who will join us through a recording, unfortunately not in person, and uh, Charlie Gu. George is a dive manager uh, based in Madagascar working with Blue Ventures and Charlie is the monitoring and evaluation manager of the organization. She is based in the UK. Charlie, up to you, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Let me just share my screen. Okay, um, so thank you Murray for the introduction and uh, Leferetti for the, the keynote. Um, so as Marie said, I am Charlie Goff. I'm, in, uh, I'm the head of monitoring and evaluation with Blue Ventures, and um, I'm going to be talking about um, a model that has been developed um, in Madagascar for fisheries management to kickstart border community-based conservation. Um, and as Marie also said, we're going to be hearing um, from Bic, uh, George Manahira, who is our dive manager and is one of the community members um, from the Vilindjik, um area, locally managed marine area, um, later on in this presentation. So the solution that we're presenting is um, a solution that starts with voluntary uh, community-based temporary closures for octopus. Um, these temporary closures help to improve catches and to build support for local conservation, um, and particularly through uh, community-based conservation. The context in which these solutions work uh, in um, tropical marine 
coastal communities where people are highly reliant on fishing for food and income. These communities have, have very, very high levels of poverty with many people, high proportions of people living on less than $2 a day. People are, um, suffer from long-term food insecurity because of this, in, this high dependence on fishing. Um, and also there's a lack of natural resource management in general, but also there's a lack of incentive for any kind of conservation or resource management. So the solution really starts um, at the very beginning with community vulnerability assessments, basically talking to communities, understanding what their perceptions of the resources are, um, whether they feel like there is a need for management, and whether there's any local leadership or even motivation for management to happen. After that, if people in those communities are interested in learning more about how management might work for their community, we try to set up these peer-to-peer -peer learning exchanges. Often there's other communities like those we've worked with in Madagascar who have been through this experience before, others in Fiji or in other places around the world who've implemented these types of uh, closures before and are very, very good um, places for new communities who are interested in implementing this solution to go and visit, to talk to other fishermen who have had these real experiences of implementing these closures and implementing local conservation themselves. Um, and really that's where the magic happens, is learning by seeing other fishers coming and talking to other fishers and exchanging ideas and then taking that home to their own communities and adapting it to their local fisheries contexts. Once they get back to their communities, um, it's really about collaborative everything, every, everything from design to rules and regulations. So really the next step is designing the closures which target species are you going to be closing for? This works really well for fast growing and short lived species like octopus, um, but it's also been tried for crabs and lobster in Madagascar as well. Identifying with the community which area they want to close, which sites, um, and also who else is using those areas, so collaborating with other surrounding villages and talking to other stakeholders to determine whether it's possible, whether they're happy to go along with it, and to determine what times of year, what seasons they want to close, um, and when it's going to open, most importantly. The next step is around rules and regulations. Um, who can have access to these closures, um, particularly during the closed period? Are, are people going to continue to fish in these areas? Is no fishing going to be allowed or is it just going to be stopped for that specific target species? Can people go travel through the area um, if they need to go and visit the nearby island or to go and visit their fields to, to farm or fetch crops? Who's going to be uh, guarding and surveying this area and who, importantly, who's going to enforce any fines? Deciding on fines is super important. The fines should be um, high enough that it's um, that it kind of is uh, a, a, it's going to put off people from doing um, any infractions. But at the same time, it it can't be so little that it does it doesn't really um, doesn't really matter to the people. But not too high that no one's ever going to be able to afford to pay it. Um, and finally, what are the rules and regulations that surround the opening day? So who can fish? How much can they fish? Do they want, how are you going to um, make sure you've got enough uh, people to buy the catches um, on those opening days? So all of those big conversations that all need to happen before the closures are even put in place. And then finally, once everything's agreed, we put in place the community closures. Um, and then, and these are usually um, supported through local, local regulations. 
Um, but then also we need to plan the opening. The opening days are busy and exciting and everyone's there with their spears and um, everyone's very, very excited. And so everything needs to be really planned in advance. So all of the procedures of how, how do people know when they can start fishing, um, who's going to do the, the um, traditional ceremony to open the closure, um, who's, how are we going to monitor the catches? It's important to be able to capture the increases or the benefits that, are, that the, the community is seeing um, and feeding back those results to the community um, from those closures. So those are the steps, um, and Blue Ventures has been implementing these community-based closures um, over the last 10 to 12 years with communities in Madagascar, and it's been spreading. So I'm going to hand over a little bit to Vic. Um, he sent this pre-recorded message, <laughs> and he's going to talk a little bit more about the impacts that we've seen um, from these closures and what that's led to. We close our first, our first octopus fishing site around the small island called Lucifasi for six months back in 2004. Octopus grow extremely fast, so when the first was reopening, the people saw octopus much bigger than they would ever seen it before. People caught more octopus and bigger octopus within the income rising after the closure. At the villages Charlie, we lost the sound there unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, so I'll, I'll carry on from Vic. Um, so I think what he says next is that um, is really what they saw after those first openings, um, when they reopened the closures, other villagers came, they heard about the openings, they came along and they saw what people were catching, these bigger octopus, um, and so the closures started to spread. So we started with one closure in one village and then the next year it went to three, then to seven, then 12, and then we were having 25, 30 octopus closures happening each year. Um, and then not only did that spread um, in terms of temporary closures, but it also within the communities that were implementing those closures started the conversation around other types of local management. Um, what other things can we do to start to protect our own oceans and our future? Um, and as Alifretti said earlier, the, the Vezu, the people who live in these areas, are, their, the, their lifeblood is the ocean and the fish that comes out of it. Um, and so it was really this, these benefits that people were seeing from octopus closures um, kick-started this um, conversation around other broader local management efforts. Um, and so, I guess to wrap up um, in terms of key reflections and lessons that we've learned, um, really working with communities um, from the ground up is the way to go um, to build support for community management. It's important to, uh, particularly at the beginning and particularly with the peer exchanges, to involve key influential fishers. So people within those communities, within those fishing communities who are very influential and well respected. After those peer-to-peer -peer -peer exchanges to capitalize on the momentum that those create, people are excited when they've got a story to tell. And so capitalize on that and, and follow up with those conversations. Consult with people early, other stakeholders, other villages, and particularly buyers um, for, fit, for the fisheries projects. Um, monitoring and, and uh, feedback to communities about what's happening is key. And also planning and communication. You can never plan and communicate too much. Um, and I guess finally, 
um, we're learning about the model uh, continuously and how it works. Um, with every replication of temporary closures that Blue Ventures does ourselves in Madagascar, um, with partners in Madagascar or in other countries, um, really we're learning more and more about how the model works and how it can be adapted and how it can work in different contexts. Um, and then finally, as Alifretti also said earlier, um, we're finding that these aren't the only, like they're not a silver bullet. There is, these are part of the solution and these need to be integrated with other approaches and other solutions. Um, otherwise they don't work on their own to, to rebuild the, the, the fisheries that we, that these communities rely on. Um, so sorry about the, <laughs> the uh, problems with the sound, but misato bevata, which is thank you very much in Malagasy. Misato Charlie, and also Bic in his absence. Uh, thanks for sharing this very compelling example and really a scaling up success story from Madagascar, how you went from one fishery closure to, to 25 within a very short period of time. <laughs> And just a reminder to all our participants to please submit any questions and comments you might have for our speakers. We will have a little bit of time to address these in the end. So please don't be shy. Type your questions in the, in the questions panel. We're curious to hear from you. Next, we're going to hear a case study from the Bird's Head Seascape. Uh, Laurie Katz will be presenting and I hope she's going to explain how the Bird's Head Seascape got that name. Laurie is the Senior Director for the Connected Oceans Program at Conservation International and she's based in the United States. Laurie? Wonderful. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Just All right, there we go. I think I just got the... Um, has that popped up? Not yet, sorry. All right, well, as it's uh, working through the system, I'll just take an opportunity to um, thank Panorama and Blue Solutions for inviting me to speak and spread uh, our, our story and other success stories. And um, it's always a pleasure to, to speak with Alfredi and, and Charlie. And I think there's a lot of synergies and between our different examples. Um, the setting and context is actually remarkably similar, um, but uh, slightly different approaches, and I think that they're really complementary. So thank you for your perspectives as well. Um, Lori, you guys... um, could you make could you um, go and make sure you click sh the screen sharing? Make sure it is clicked. Um, I thought that I did. Where would I look? Go under sharing in the user interface, um, and then there's a show screen. There's an arrow. Is that clicked? Should be green. Um, and, no, I can't even click on the sharing uh, button. Hmm. All right, well, I'll take. I'm getting a buzz in my ear. <laughs> okay, let me go back and I'll take it back and then switch it back to you. Okay. Okay. Um, well, while we're working that out, I will uh, answer <laughs> Marie's question about how the Bird's Head Seascape got its name, because I wasn't planning to speak to that. Um, so the Bird's Head Seascape is located in eastern Indonesia, uh, in the provinces of West Papua and Papua, um, on the island of New Guinea. And uh, when Dutch cartographers first uh, explored the island of New Guinea, um, they noted that the, the island looked a little bit like a bird. Um, I think it's more kind of like a, an awkward turkey, um, but it is, is bird-shaped. Um, and the region that we're talking about is in the, the northern western tip, which would be kind of the head and the neck of, of the bird of the island of New Guinea. Um, and it's a name that has lasted and stayed in Indonesia. Uh, in local language, they actually call it the kapala burung, the, the bird's head. Um, and so we, we kept the name in, in its English form, um, which does often raise questions. 
Um, how are we doing on the sharing? I'm still not seeing any different. Um, I'll switch to Marie. We're, we're still not seeing it, so I'm going to go ahead and switch to Marie, who has your presentation. Let's see. Okay, Laurie, so just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Oh, you know what? I just saw it. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's now showing from my screen, so you'll need to let me know when you want to have the next slide. Okay? Lori, we can't hear you anymore. Lori, if, uh, if you can hear us, it's possible that you've muted yourself. Um, Marie, while we wait and see if Lori is able to rejoin, there was a question. Uh, sure, let's go ahead with that. That was a question for Charlie. Uh, so Christine Hayes asked, other than improved catches reported by fishers, what ways are closures being evaluated? Are there before and after control impact studies? Charlie, will you be able to answer that? Yeah, sure. Um, yes, there is um, before and after control and impact studies for the closures, um, for the temporary closures that's written up in a PLOS paper, which was um, the uh, citation is at the bottom of the screen on one of the um, on one of the slides in the in the presentation, um, the one with the uh, balances. Um, it's written by uh, Tom Oliver and Kirsten Olson. Um, so that, that does the, the, the full backy of the temporary closures. And we're just now um, submitting, writing, it's almost in submission, a paper on the, um, the impact of permanent closures um, that we've seen so far. Uh, yeah, thank you, Marie. <laughs> Um, that we've seen so far, um, and we're actually starting to see positive um, increases in biomass, fish biomass, inside the permanent closures that have been put in place by um, these same communities where we started working 10 years ago. Okay. Thanks, Charlie. I found somebody, an, another Laura Katz entrance. I don't know if Laura was able to join on another a line or not so yeah, I, no, I'm, I'm I'm back I just great the, um, yes so okay uh, I apologies I'm not sure why I got disconnected there but sounds like you went to questions no issues we'll take your presentation now and we're going to show it from my computer so just let me know when you want to have the next slide okay okay great and Marie I'm not seeing your screen yes okay there we go and Lori, you're a little okay, faint. Are you able to get closer to your microphone? Um, yes, better. is that yeah. any better? Yes, okay, much better. Great. great. So apologies for the uh, <laughs> the technical difficulties, um, but I'll dive right in. So um, I'm going to be sharing with you a case study from Eastern Indonesia, as I mentioned, the, the bird's head seascape. Um, and this is a joint initiative. It's a it's a a program that's 13 years in the running. Um, we now have over 30 partners who have been actively working under one um, framework and vision in the bird's head. Um, but it was started with a core partnership between Conservation International, then Nature Conservancy, and WWF. And so I'd like to specifically acknowledge them um, before uh, moving on to, to the whole presentation. Um, one thing that I think is, uh, you can go ahead and uh, switch slides. One thing that is a little bit different from this case study to the other two that we have talked about uh, previously um, is that instead of starting in one community and, and kind of virally going and spreading community-based management, the Birds Head Seascape was uh, focused around a seascapes approach in which there was kind of a design for scale from the beginning. So a deep commitment to community-based management 
but attempting to do it at a, a large scale right from the start and to design for that purpose. And so I think there's a lot of lessons in both directions that, that are very interesting. So just to give you an overview of the place, so the, the seascape itself, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is in West Papua and Papua provinces of Indonesia. Maybe you can kind of see the bird's head shape there. Uh, the seascape is, is the area delineated within that yellow line. Um, and the total seascape is 22.5 million hectares. So it's a fairly large area. It's, a, it's about the same size as Great Britain, so where Charlie's sitting today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the initiative has featured been 30 partners who have been working together for the last 13 years in a coordinated fashion across the seascape. And the kind of getting to the punchline a little bit, but the, the major impact or, or results of this um, uh, program has been the development of Indonesia's first effective MPA network um, throughout this seascape. Um, the network includes 15 marine protected areas covering over 4 million hectares um, with three new ones just declared in the last uh, couple of months. Within each one of them, 20 to 30 percent of the area is completely closed as no take. Um, and the, the remaining areas are for the exclusive sustainable use of local communities uh, in those regions. Um, the, all of the marine protected areas other than one national park uh, were created through a bottom-up community-driven process. Um, and they were designed for both ecological and social impact um, at the same time. Um, you want to move to the next slide? Um, and you can uh, advance as well. So, great. So um, the context here is, is very similar to actually the context that uh, the two previous presenters described. Um, the waters around the Bird's Head Seascape are among the richest, if not the richest, reservoirs of life on Earth. There's, there's more marine biodiversity there than anywhere else found in our oceans. Um, but similarly to other, other places that we've heard, these ecosystems are the absolute lifeblood and kitchen for indigenous communities. Um, in this particular area, similar to Fiji, there is tenure and, and ownership rights over these marine areas. Um, but as poaching from outsiders had come in, um, these fisheries that were owned by indigenous communities had been severely depleted, um, leaving the majority of local communities food insecure um, and very quickly losing their tenure rights, um, as well as uh, a lot of their traditional practices in this region. And so that was the context from which this initiative was established. And progress. So the, the building blocks are numerous and complex. Uh, a seascapes approach is really an integrated holistic approach to managing an entire area. And, and so um, I've picked out a, a subset of these focused on the topic at hand. Um, but there's a lot more to the seascape strategy that I'd be happy to take questions on. Um, the first building block to focus on is the development of social and political support and partnership. Um, with the goal of building community-driven conservation at a seascape scale required mobilizing community action at that scale. Um, and so the, the first many years of the program um, were focused on innovative communication and outreach programs that have lasted to this day. And all of them were focused around reaching lots of people through mechanisms that they relate to. So pictured here as an example, uh, the Calabia is our uh, education vessel. Uh, it's a floating classroom that teaches marine conservation to children. And it goes from village to village to village, reaching every kid in West Papua every other year. Um, the other piece of this was building a network of civil society and Papuan leadership within um, the area. And so that was where we helped develop all of these various partners um, to be part of the system. Um, there's no way to reach scale working alone. The second building block is really the, the heart and soul of the initiative, um, and that is the development of the, the marine protected area network itself. 
Um, and this I could speak to for hours, but we'll just give you a little nugget. Um, the, the Marine Protected Area Network was designed uh, with best science uh, in mind and, and extensive scientific um, data, but entirely in partnership with local communities and through a bottom-up process um, and co-design process. Um, the MPA network was designed around tenure boundaries and incorporates traditional practices um, and values in, in every layer of the, the design and the management. Um, and then the management systems within it were designed for maximum participation by local community members. So one example is the patrol system, um, which one of our patrol teams is pictured here at, at the bottom right. Um, we have a, a network of, of over 20 uh, field stations and patrol stations around the seascape. Each one of them is responsible for patrolling um, a large area of the protected area that covers multiple clans' tenurial areas. So to uh, ensure that everybody felt a part of it, um, we actually developed a, a rolling patrol system in which all community members uh, participate on a yearly basis in a tour of duty in which they come and participate in the patrolling of their marine protected area, um, working in collaboration with the communities near them um, so that they learn about conservation, participate in the system, um, and, and have ownership over it. Um, and in this way, thousands of community members are active MPA uh, staff and managers. Um, and we actually now have some, some women, all women patrol teams as well. So, so we're uh, increasing their involvement, which is something um, that is, I think, needed more of. Uh, so the, the third, you can um, move to the next slide. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to speed up just a little bit because we're almost at the full hour already. Sorry about yes. that. Absolutely. I know the technical difficulties. So um, I'll talk about this third one very briefly and then wrap up with lessons. So the, the third building block um, is that if you want to do uh, community-based management at this scale, um, there needs to be the institutions and financing from which those communities can lead. Um, and so a big focus of our program for the last number of years, and, and really from the start, was not only building community capacity, but building institutions, whether it was NPA management authorities, uh, or local civil society, local NGOs and universities that could play critical roles in, in the management. Um, so this is just depicting a transition from international staff to local staff and local institutions. We can switch to the next slide. Um, and that was uh, followed up with, with an extensive strategy on ensuring sustainable financing so that these community-led institutions had access to the revenue they need to be able to not only do these activities right now, but in perpetuity, that they have funding forever uh, to be able to manage the region. Uh, quickly, some impacts. Uh, just go ahead and scroll through these. Um, we have an extensive monitoring program that has shown these community teams have reduced illegal fishing uh, by 90%. Uh, we're seeing fish biomass increase substantially in many of the protected areas. Um, local fishers are catching more catch with the same level of effort. Uh, tourism is booming. Um, and most significantly, the marine protected areas have generated a... Um, uh, sorry, can you hear me? I just saw a uh, warning. Yes, we can hear you. Just please wrap okay, up great. within the next minute or so. Yep. Yep. So um, that there's been uh, statistically significant increases in food security and education uh, from the marine protected areas. Um, so the next slide um, is just a couple of, of reflections and lessons. And um, I would say that the the main crux of it is that if you want to be designing for community-led conservation at scale from the start. Um, it involves uh, involving communities from the start in every level of it um, and ensuring widespread participation um, throughout. So with that, I'll say thank you, and uh, I know we're over in time. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Laurie, for introducing this truly impressive initiative. And sorry to rush you a little bit um, as we've run out of time due to the technical difficulties. Um, we're over time a little bit, but I'm just checking if we have any questions. And I think uh, for those who are willing to stay on a couple minutes longer, we can take one or two questions and then wrap up. If you have to leave, obviously feel free to do so. So we had another question from Dawn Bailey. She asked, there are massive international funders involved. How do the small island nations, locals, etc., access funding to implement programs? Who are the li liaisons between institutions and communities? I guess this is a question that could be addressed to all three presenters, but maybe most relevant to Laurie's case study. Laurie, do you want to answer this? Sure, I can take a start. Um, and I think that was the, the, the crux of the issue that I was getting to at the, at the very end, that oftentimes uh, community-based organizations have um, difficulty accessing and um, large, you know, international sources of funding and, and complying with all of those regulations. And so there's um, multiple mechanisms to help address that. In, in our case, uh, we focused extensively on not only building the capacity of those community-led organizations to meet uh, international reporting standards, but we also developed a dedicated fund um, that channeled and leveraged a lot of different funding from those international uh, donors into one fund, the, the Blue Body Fund, that then is now available specifically to be giving grants on an annual basis to community-based organizations um, mm -hmm. that can be done in their local language and, and more um, easily accessible. And so I think that that's a, a key role for some of the bigger organizations like my own um, to help to kind of bridge and, ch and channel funding um, and, and make sure that there is access for uh, community-based organizations to those funding sources. Thanks. Charlie, Ali Ferretti, would you like to add anything on this question? Yeah, uh, this is Ali Ferretti. If I can go, um, I think the, the LMMA uh, network uh, grew uh, out of that need, uh, expressed uh, as a question uh, to be able to and it's now the LMA network is now a an organization that uh, that uh, includes that is an association of community-based organization and local NGOs eh? uh, and the LMA uh, network helps to connect um, communities to local uh, funders or local opportunities but also outside uh, funders and um, and uh, help build their capacity to the international level. And as I refer to the LMMA uh, network. Uh, it has a um, uh, you know a network in Fiji that is uh, in in Solomon Islands, in PNG, uh, in other countries that that have uh, scaled up to the to the national uh, level. Uh, individual communities may not necessarily have uh, the capacity but uh, we'll be working on a, a like island scale model where they can collectively set up in a, a, a community-based organization that can uh, uh, with a supportive uh, institutional mechanisms that can uh, uh, receive uh, funds and and also uh, implement uh, projects that are uh, part of the uh, of grants eh? and uh, uh, yes it's a, it's a work in uh, in in progress and many of those uh, island communities or islands uh, have also set up their own trust fund um, in the case of uh, you know, for Fiji, um, and and also their own fundraising mechanisms to not only rely on um, outside uh, funding, but uh, look at ways that they can self-sustain uh, the management of uh, the um, MPA conservation efforts. 
Thank you both. We have another question from Marti Martin Romain. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Hi, can Laurie please repeat the name of the body providing the grants to support community-based initiatives? It could be incredibly useful for us in the Marshall Islands. Sure. So the the fund is called the Blue Abadi Fund. Um, it's been established specifically for the the Bird's Head Seascape, and so um, I think it's a model that could be um, definitely useful to learn about for other regions. But un unfortunately, the funding is wouldn't be available to the Marshall Islands. But there's a lot of um, thinking that went into the design on how to um, how to be as inclusive as possible to community-based organizations. So I'd be I'd be happy to follow up by email with uh, mm -hmm. providing some of the the more detail on that fund if that would be useful. Thank you. Another question from Shanique Smith, uh, working for the Nature Conservancy in the Bahamas. Any advice for proposing or negotiating a closure on an island where there are no land and sea tenure rights? where the main species under threat has matures, matures at about three to four years old? I think this question is particularly relevant for Charlie. Sorry, could you just repeat the question? Sure. The question was, how would you have any advice on proposing or negotiating a fishery closure on an island where there are no land and sea tenure rights? So that's the first difference. Mm -hmm. as uh, compared to the situation in Madagascar that you presented, and secondly, where the main species under threat matures at about three to four years old. Yeah, so, I mean, it, our approach would really be to to try and understand what might work. If, if closures aren't possible, um, talking with the community about um, what might be possible to manage those fisheries? Um, if there's no, if there's no local tenure, then yeah, it might be more difficult to do a local-based management. Um, if there's no, if if there's no ability for communities to to make those decisions, then it, it would be more about, um, I guess advocacy towards the government in supporting communities to be able to do that um, and to strengthen basically asking the government if you can if you can move towards having some sort of local management systems um, if that's what communities want to do and starting to be that voice for communities um, yeah that would be my kind of <laughs> I don't it's kind of very different yeah. to the approach that we would use um, but then, yeah, if if temporary closures or permanent closures are not the uh, at, at, from a local level might not be possible, then you you would probably look for other solutions. Okay, thank you. Can I? Can Did I you want to add anything? Just, sure. Yeah, just a maybe a quick um, uh, comment in addition. Uh, uh, one is, uh, I think, what um, for for the tenure system, the the principles of uh, tenure or the can be can be applied uh, anywhere without uh, uh, in areas without uh, tenure system, which is having a sense of ownership. It doesn't have to be uh, encoded in tenure, but as long as as they have a sense of ownership or a sense of responsibility. And, uh, and that can come in the form of a fisherman association or whatever body that uh, brings them together. Uh, and that could be the, that can be the starting point. And we've, we've seen that work in places like um, uh, Australia, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, communities and in other uh, areas too, they don't have uh, a tenure system. Eh? And uh, so I think it's, it's work, it's the principle that can be uh, applied uh, across. Uh, and um, yeah, and and I think the 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 species uh, is you know the, the starting point is what they what they agree with, uh, 
for the the communities and doesn't have to be uh, you know golden standard but it's something that they can work with with the understanding that they can improve uh, over time um, it, I mean I say um, they can the three years um, uh, we've we have our experience in Fiji the fees that uh, matures uh, five years uh, but we start with one year one year closer they evaluate and then they see that it's not enough and then they extend another year another year until it comes to the to the the year that um, you know gives them maturity gives that fees maturity okay thanks I'm afraid we're now really going to to have to wrap up, um, but great to see this uh, sharing of experiences across uh, very different regions between our speakers and participants. Uh, all further questions that we weren't able to answer now, we'll make sure to send to the respective presenter for whom they were addressed and uh, hopefully they'll be able to get back to you in writing. So let me just thank everyone who joined and of course a very big thanks to our three presenters for introducing their work, uh, answering questions and, and taking the time today. If you don't know it yet, please make sure to visit the Panorama web platform. You can see the URL on the slide here. The full descriptions of the two case studies that were presented in the webinar are available on the platform along with a wealth of other case studies so please really use it as a resource and help us to promote it further also let us know your feedback about the platform how can we improve it um, you can also email us if you have suggestions if you would like to partner with your organizations or contribute a solution case study of your own there will be a recording of today's webinar available, so we'll share the link with everyone who registered. And uh, of course, uh, the Panorama webinar series will continue, so please look out for the announcement of the next session, and we hope many of you will, will join us again. Thanks again, everyone, and uh, have a great day, and goodbye. Goodbye.